Welcome to the first episode of the Your Audio Solutions podcast. Thank you for listening. Um, you're probably used to reading interviews here, but I thought it would be a fun experiment releasing the interviews as audio for you guys, just like a podcast. Um, in the first episode, we have the awesome mixer Bob Horn, who has worked with artists such as Michael Jackson, Timbaland, Usher, Lupe Fiasco, and many others. Uh, before we jump into the conversation with Bob, I want to tell you about a new guide that you can download for free on youraudiosolutions.com. Um, it's called Three Tested Ways to Increase Your Client Base. Uh, so if you're a home studio owner or a professional audio engineer, but you're struggling to find clients, or you're wondering where to start and you have no clients, or you're struggling what to say or write to bands to make them come back to you, then this guide is for you. You can learn my tested email script that will help you start talking to new clients or bands online. Uh, you will also learn a technique I call the, the coffee technique, which has landed me many great opportunities in recording studios in London. I will also introduce a topic that has changed how I think about pricing, and I think that can be very beneficial for you and let you get out of the time-based rates, etc., and start doing value-based rates instead. Uh, so yeah, check it out on youraudiosolutions.com. But now over to Bob Horn. Perfect, you see that we're recording, we are recording, right? <laughs> Don't want to do that mistake. <laughs> uh, cool. cool. So how's your day been? Are you working on something at the moment? Oh. Uh. Man, I'm just getting started. I had a marathon mix weekend. I had to do five mixes over the weekend. Oh, shit. So it was a little rough. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, so what made you, because I know you played bass, you know. Um, you weren't only doing uh, mixing and stuff. Um, yeah. So could you just tell us how you started or why you started playing bass in the first place? Um, I actually played guitar, drums, bass, piano, and I started out on sax. Right. Um, <laughs> oh, so it was saxophone. Yeah. So, yeah. So, like, you know, I think it's pretty common in the United States. Like, when you get to fifth grade in school, you have to join either the choir, the orchestra, or a band. And my dad had a, a tenor saxophone, so he gave that to me, and I joined the band. And then the next year, I joined the jazz band. And then I think around seventh grade, I, I found, you know, an electric guitar in our garage and started messing with that. And then my cousin gave me a bass. And at one point, we had an exchange student, and he played the drums. So we had just more and more instruments. And then my grandparents had a piano, and we moved into their house. So <laughs> now I had, like, one of everything. Right. And uh, I would just come home from school and just do the rounds, you know, drums. I'd start with drums because my parents weren't home, so I wouldn't annoy them. And then, yeah. you know, piano, bass, guitar. And uh, at school, I played sax. So, yeah, I just kind of my my middle school and my high school i was just every day after school in a different band uh in one of those instruments and i just loved music and then eventually you know when you're in the band I re we want to record ourselves so we started getting into the the task m4 tracks and uh alisa's adats and stuff like that and trying to record ourselves you know not very well and <laughs> i uh i think at that same time in high school i did uh sound at our church um every sunday so i got to learn like the mixers and microphones and all that kind of stuff and um so i did a bunch of live sound for and for that kind of stuff and then uh man i guess the further i got in high school the more i just i discovered berkeley college of music and i wanted to go there for something i didn't know what and uh an alumni that i met told me to go for bass because there's the least amount of bass players there's a thousand drummers a thousand guitar players <laughs> but go for bass you'll always be in demand and so I went for bass and uh, I uh, also knew they had a bunch of the studio stuff and music synthesis and film scoring. So I knew I'd, I was going to do something more than just uh, play an mm -hmm. instrument. And I, I decided to go into the music production engineering. I had interned at a studio the last two years of high school. And uh, so, yeah, I just kind of went through college playing bass mostly and the kind of the other instruments kind of fell away during that time. Right. And, uh, cause I couldn't, I couldn't take them all to my dorm room, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, 
<laughs> but did you have a favorite <laughs> instrument out of all those instruments? Or was that bass? It was bass. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, good. I was, I was real into, uh, you know, in the late 90s, all those bass solo albums came out, like Stanley Clark and Marcus Miller. And, right. you know, Primus was one of my favorite bands, you know, all the crazy yeah. bass playing, you know. <laughs> So yeah. I got I got real into that, you know. Nice. And, uh, yeah, man. Do you still play? Uh, what's that? Do you still play? Yeah, the bass? yeah. Yeah, actually, I'm gonna play bass on a recording today. Uh, a song I'm mixing. Someone asked me. They said uh, uh, they needed a record bass before I mix it, and uh, and then some. One of my other friends was sitting there, like, "Oh, Bob plays bass." So now I'm playing bass and mixing. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But do you have a favorite bass, or do you have several uh, favorite basses? I favorite bass probably favorite sounding bass is probably a lakeland and i forget the model number but it's a five string that a friend of mine has but i really have always loved fender jazz basses and fender p basses you know right. um as far as one that i own it's probably i have a jazz bass deluxe four string which is oh, pretty cool really? like that. yeah yeah Cause I also actually started out playing bass, you know, and Flea uh, was okay. my big inspiration. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I love Primus. <laughs> That's funny, man. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, uh, how did attending Berkeley improve your understanding of music and bass? Oh man, um, Berkeley's amazing, man. It's it's without going to other schools, I I always maintain it's it's got to be one of the best. Uh, just the way especially for studio stuff, just because there's so many musicians there and a lot of audio schools, you don't have musicians, you just have other audio students. And when I was at Berkeley, it was just like 3,000. It was a small, small college, like 3,000 people. I'm not sure how big it is now, but <clears throat> you just like go out into the hallway and yell, I need a drummer. And like three people put their hands up, you know? So like the access to music and music from all over the world, it's like you can just walk down the hall on the way to class and there's an ensemble playing some kind of Afro Cuban thing you've never heard and just stick your head in and hang out for 10 minutes and meet people. And all of a sudden next thing, next thing you know, you're learning Afro Cuban music, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's just amazing. Just the access you have to people from all over the world that play music. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, Berkeley, Berkeley was great. I mean, I, my skills as a bass player went up, tenfold and then as well as uh you know engineering you know you got to i got to spend so much time uh in the studios and i i got a job as a student uh in the offices of the studio so i had keys so i had like extra access <laughs> nice <laughs> so, that was yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah but did, yeah. did you record a lot of bands at berkeley as well then oh yeah yeah that was the awesome thing i mean i recorded bands probably uh 15 20 times a month you know um mm -hmm. And then practice mixing the rest of the times. I mean, almost every day I was either mixing or recording somebody for at least two hours. Right. So uh, I got a lot of time, you know, miking up drums and piano and uh, B3 organ and all that kind of stuff and horn sections. Nice. So, um, yeah, I got a lot of practice uh, with microphones. So it was, it was really cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Uh, but so did you did you change course to the production side or you still finish the course as a bass player or how uh, i actually work? ended up not doing an official double major but what i right. did was in in the studio i uh worked in in high school i had some ssl experience so i tested out of classes that were studio classes mm -hmm. and i filled them in with bass courses so i was right. able to continue bass throughout the you know the four years um even though i majored in engineering oh, okay nice uh, but then you also, you, you went to Nashville, right? Um, yeah. So after school, you know, I kind of talked to some of the graduates from the year before me and yeah. I guess in that time it was 1998 and they were talking about how it was all drum machines and the only microphones that they put up are for vocals and stuff. So that, that kind of bothered me cause I just learned all these skills. I wanted to, you know, to learn them on an even bigger level. So I went to Nashville and Nashville was you know, seven musicians in one room, you know, you, had, you know, it's a lot of pressure and a lot of intense tracking. Um, so that was good for me. I went there for about three years uh, until I kind of got tired of the music. Um, and the city, Nashville back in the 90s, wasn't very cultured. Um, right. 
So compared to LA, you know, you come out here and the food and the people and the music, it's so varied. You can, there's a little bit of everything, you know, uh, including everything that's in Nashville. So mm. the only difference out here is, is the studios are more private where in Nashville, they were more public back in the day, you know, big right. signs and you just walk right in and out here in LA, it's just a, a high fence with a number, you know, you <laughs> yeah. can't, can't even tell it's a studio. Right. So, right. Yeah. Um, so, what does it require to be a, uh, an engineer in, in Nashville? Is it different than LA, for uh, example? Yeah, it's a little bit different. At least back then, I, I don't. Now it's probably a little bit similar. I mean, a lot of people are in Pro Tools. Um, it's probably relaxed a little bit, but Nashville, you really had to know your stuff back then, um, including reading charts uh, and Nashville specific charts. Nashville has a, a thing called the Nashville number system right. with their chord progression so instead of if you're in the key of c instead of c d e flat it's one two flat three and you just go by numbers that way in the middle of the session if someone yells out change the key to a it's still one two flat three you don't have right. to transpose you know right so you, you got to be able to follow along with charts and you know the tape machines you know we had to you had all the numbers you know you had, and it wasn't as easy as pro, pro tools you had to really be on your game and You know, you got a bunch of musicians in the live room staring back at you. You don't want ever to keep them waiting, you know. Yeah. So yeah. it was. It seemed like it was a little more pressure. I'm sure it was uh, a little bit like that out here too. But Nashville is definitely get everybody in the room and record them all at once, kind of thing. You know, where yeah. out here, I think it's a little more individual. Record the drums, record the bass, record the guitar. You know. Right. I mean, how important? I mean, it's always important to be prepared, but. Uh... How how was that back then in Nashville? Um, well, I think in Nashville they didn't. Everyone went through the check system, which was interning, and right. they made sure you were ready before they let you anywhere near the rooms. You know, right. um, some people got stuck in the intern world for you know up to a year, year and a half before they were allowed to step in the room and be an assistant. You know, right. um, I got, I got kind of lucky in that regard, but. Um, Yeah, man, it's it's. So you started every, out as an intern too. I uh, I started out as an intern for about a month at Ocean Way Nashville, and then I got a call um, from a place called the Sound Kitchen, and they had uh, just installed SSLs, but they were they were turning into a six room facility, but they started out as a two room Neve facility, and their current assistants at that time didn't know SSLs, and I had a, a Berkeley classmate that had graduated. Uh, before me and he became their studio manager or manager assistant and so he reached out to me to come be the ssl assistant basically oh, okay. uh, so i got to leave interning after a month and jump right into assisting which is cool nice nice yeah. man uh was it then you decided to move to la right after was it three years about three years um i actually went to north carolina charlotte and worked with james brown and then a few um Uh, Christian artist and also uh, uh, just a couple of other random artists that used uh, Atlanta and Charlotte as their home base. So I did that for about eight months and then went to LA. Oh, okay. <clears throat> How was that experience yeah. working with uh, James Brown? Uh, insane. <laughs> <laughs> Were you uh, engineering uh, or assisting? Or? Yeah. I, yeah. I actually mixed, mixed and uh, uh, did, I did one recording session. Uh, they had Uh, let's see, there was a regular engineer at that studio that worked with him a lot. And then I did one session and then one mix session. Um, yeah, it was insane. Like he's, he was an insane guy, just really eccentric. And, you know, you couldn't understand him when he talked <laughs> like his, his, his little cousin always translated everything and oh, yeah. everybody, everybody was Mr. Mr. Horn, you know, Mr. Brown, no hats in the studio, you know? Oh, okay. And, uh, How come? Like a lot of a lot of politeness and a lot of right. respect, you know. Right. So, But he yeah. also tracks live, then I guess, right? Oh yeah, whole yeah. band, like twelve people in the room, background singers included, like no overdubs. Even right. himself, like he might redo a vocal later, but it was all at once, you know. Everybody, so it's pretty pretty crazy. Wow. So, uh, what record was that, or do you have a name for it? Um. I don't know what that was titled. Uh, and actually, I don't know if it came out. I, I would have to check. Um, 
I think he just liked to be always be recording. So it was just he did tracks and tracks and tracks. I don't I don't think that it actually formed an album. Um, right, right, at least right. not to my knowledge. Yeah. yeah. But does he also sing in the live room or because he strikes me as a guy who would do that? He does. He puts yeah. up the three baffles behind him and then sings right standing right in the live room. And I, I believe he always I believe he wanted a U-47. I think he sang into a U-47. Right. But uh, yeah. And then in this particular live room was a studio called Reflections. Really big live room, too. Right. Okay. Uh, that's what nice, he liked. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so when when you moved to LA, um, how did you go about setting up your base there? As how to find how did you find clients? And uh, how, how did you get started it working? Was, it was horrible. Oh, yeah? <laughs> so, it was scary, I should say. Not horrible. It was just scary. But uh, I had one really good friend out here, and he was busy doing his thing. He was uh, doing uh, tour managing and uh, uh, keyboards and uh, string arranging and stuff, and So I came out here and I had some money saved up and I kind of lived on that. And uh, I, I moved out with my now studio partner, Eric Rikers, who we built this studio together. And I actually found him a job before myself. <laughs> right. So I, I got him, him a job at Interscope uh, through a friend I knew. But I was trying not to go back to assisting if possible. I was trying to, you know, I figured I moved to a <clears throat> new city. Maybe I just call myself an engineer and not assist anymore. And uh, I figured it, if the, of all the ways to break the cycle of assisting and move into engineering, you either got to quit your job at a studio or get picked up by someone or just declare yourself uh, an engineer. And that's what I did. So um, at that point, I, that kind of severed any possibility of working at a studio because they're not looking for engineers. They're looking for interns. Mm. Um, and uh, so I just tried to meet people. And the first thing that happened was uh, – I got a job. My friend passed on a gig that he didn't want to do anymore for Brandy and Ray J Norwood. Um, so Brandy, the famous R and B singer and then her little brother, um, Ray J and actually their father was a gospel singer, all signed to Atlantic, all three family members. So I became their daily house engineer and, uh, you know, they, there's like two studios between Brandy and Ray J and the father and, I would just kind of maintain them and go over to their house when they called me and record them. And <clears throat> that was just kind of my gig to get started as I met more people and uh, just kind of grew from there. I mean, the, the biggest break was actually when I went back home to Charlotte where my parents were living and I visited that studio reflections and uh, they had booked a person from LA named Ron Feemster also went by the name of nephew and, uh, He had just worked with 50 Cent and uh, Eminem, and he was booking the studio for a week, and they asked me to stay uh, past Christmas and work with him. So I did, and I found out that we both lived out here right down the street from each other. Mm -hmm. So we worked for about a week, and we really got along, and then we decided when we got back to L.A. that we would form a partner partnership and start working together. Right. And then that was my ne next five years was basically being his engineer and mixer. Nice. Uh, that's very interesting, man, because, I mean, did you at any point <clears throat> before the ball started rolling, so to speak, were, did you ever question, you know, uh, should I do this for a living or should I go back home or were you determined? No, yeah, I was determined. I knew it was just a matter of finding the opening, you know, and I figured at the worst case scenario, I would have to, you know, go back to assisting and get it or probably interning and just start over uh you know at a studio you know just put my resume in the in the pot and you know go get a job at a studio and grow from there but uh luckily i met nephew and uh we ended up working you know so yeah yeah um, but yeah I, i didn't ever think uh i was ever gonna quit or change jobs or anything like that you know i figured there's enough recording going on you know, people are needed. It's just a matter of meeting those people that, that yeah. want you. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. Um, was that also how you then started working with, um, Usher and Timbaland, Akon and those guys? Was that through the nephew thing, which led into, uh, no. So Timbaland was just a, uh, a cold call. My, uh, 
my friend, my first friend that I lived out here in LA, we were having lunch and <clears throat> just discussing like how to get more jobs and you know, how do you meet people? And he just, uh, almost on a dare, he, he called a friend of his, you know, saying, Hey, I know this great guy, Bob Horn, you should use him. And the guy, his guy was Walter Millsap and he, uh, he hired me to do a mix for Timbaland. So next thing I, I was mixing for Timbaland. It was like that easy. <laughs> right. And I was like, oh, I, wish I, I wish I thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's how that happened. And then Usher was through, um, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis and the Avila brothers. And, uh, those are guys I just, I met through a, a mutual friend. It's like every relationship, you know, you sprout, I, I look at it as like a tree. So you have all these branches of, uh, friends and colleagues and acquaintances and then they have little branches of clients and it's just, you're building your whole tree over your career, you know? Mm. So, uh, yeah, Usher came from a friend that introduced me to, uh, the Avila brothers and then to, uh, Jimmy Jim and Terry Lewis and ended up mixing for them for a couple of years. Right. Cool. Um, so how, I mean, you, you spoke about the tree, so to speak, how it all branches out, connection there goes to another one. How, how important is it to allow time for that to happen? Because that doesn't happen overnight, right? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely not. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, that's a lifelong thing. It's, mm. um, I mean, my tree still grows and right. other branches kind of die off and, you know, people, like, they move on and get out of music or change what they do, you know, you like, you might have used to mix for a producer, but now he's an A and R guy, so you don't mix for him anymore. Or now you mix for him as an A and R guy. The branches change and and evolve, and you get new ones, and you know, yeah. uh, just like just like a real tree, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it's an always going thing. It's like the only time things go fast, I think, is when if you if you're a part of a hit record, like a really big record, and. Uh, you happen to be around a lot of people that notice that and then they're looking for what you do. And then all of a sudden you might get a lot of work from that. But <clears throat> for the most part, you know, it's just always cultivating your relationships, you know, hmm. yeah, it's an important thing. I didn't realize how important I used to, I got out of school thinking you just had to have the best sounding snare drum, you know, and, and you get hired, but it's, or you would mix something and someone would read the credits and call you and, it's funny. It's so much more relationships and recommendations. So, if, you know, my friend cold calling uh, about the Timbaland job. If I could made that call, it wouldn't have worked. It would, had to be him talking about me. You know, so mm. you uh, you championing your friend, talking good about your friend, or plugging him to a, a client is much more powerful than you trying to talk about yourself because it just. A lot of times you just seem like you're desperate or bragging, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's important for people to speak highly of you. So for sure. that's where personality becomes so important. And then the skill, which I used to think was everything is, is actually the smallest part because it's, it's not that you can't have the skill or you don't need the skill. You, you have to have the skill, but it's expected at that point. You yeah. know, the personality, the big question is the personality. It's like, does the guy shower? Does he smell good in the studio or <laughs> yeah. is, he, is he angry all the time? You know, is he good to hang out with? You know, it's like, yeah. Um, Cause a lot of these people end up becoming your friends, you know? Um, if you're going to sit in a small room for 12 hours uh, recording with somebody, you know, you want to want to be a pleasant experience, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, have you ever found working with someone that you not couldn't stand, but it was really hard? And you just couldn't wait to the session to be over. Oh yeah, yeah. For, uh, <laughs> a handful of times. Yeah. yeah, but you just have to go through it, I guess. You don't want to. Yeah, and then, pissed off, obviously. If uh, yeah, either the next time you either decline it and tell them you're busy, or or you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just some people just have different personalities, and you don't vibe with them. It's, I don't really think it's anybody's fault, you know. Um, mm. But, you know, I just try to always stay professional, you know, some people are not as professional in the studio and, um, you know, it's the next time you just choose not to work with them, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Uh, so how, how did you find networking in the beginning then when your network was small? Did you had any, have any 
uh, technique, so to speak, to gr to grow it, if that makes sense. No, that, that's that's the hardest thing, and I'm not I'm not great at that. That's why the 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 nephew job gig was so good for me because it was five years of him and his manager meeting people and introducing, and I, I just I just got to ride along. So if they had a job, I had a job. Mm -hmm. So I knew that they were going to find jobs no matter what. And, you know, they were popular and they had already had their trees grown and, and lots of branches. And um, so I just kind of got to ride along with that. So that's the great thing about if you get attached to a producer that's really in demand, you know, you just, um, you get to meet a lot of people and they're already, they're already confident in your skills because you're introduced as like, Oh, this is Bob. He's great. He's my, my daily guy. And they really like the producer. So they, in their head, they're like, well, this producer is awesome. So he must have an awesome engineer yeah. just by default. Like they don't <laughs> even examine you or test you, you know? Mm -hmm. So as long as you can, uh, deliver when called upon and then it works, you know? So I left when nephew and I stopped working together you know, I had a bunch of platinum albums and I kind of had a little bit of a, a name for myself. So it, it kind of, it's interesting after that, it kind of went back to being hard again, but I just got myself in a, in a situation working at a studio. I was actually leasing a studio and, um, these people in this building they, they had some gear and then I had some gear. So we just combined all our gear and I made a room to track and mix in and that environment just being in a, uh, a multi studio facility with the indie record label, there was always people coming through the door. So I was meeting people on a daily basis. Right. So again, it was kind of built into the situation. I wasn't just sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring or, or even trying to call people cold. Sure. You know? um, so, yeah, that's nice, man. I mean, but you still, you know, you, you still put yourself in such in that situation, as you said, you know, cause that takes work too, obviously. Yeah, wow. you got to be around people and, you know, it, it's it's hard, you know? Yeah, yeah. It takes time, I guess. That's but it's weird. It's like we're, we're one of the only industries, like, we don't advertise. Like, we don't see a, a TV commercial with Bob or Nicholas as a, no. you know, like, hey, hire me. I'm a mixer. And then, yeah. you know, you don't see that on TV or no, a magazine. No. <laughs> yeah. You, exactly. you see mastering engineers. Mastering engineers advertise in magazines. That's in studios. But wow. never producers never mixers it's so uh, weird right so what does mastering engineers do that i didn't know that actually i haven't i have just thought about it <laughs> yeah i mean at least out here there's there's magazines where you'll see a mastering facility or a studio and the studio will brag about how many famous people have come through their doors over the last couple of decades but you never see like an individual producer or engineer it's almost considered in bad taste or something i don't know yeah. So we're 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 odd industry for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting, man. Uh, so I actually heard you in the video I, I saw last week. I think uh, oh. you spoke about um, uh, a session a session you did with Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how long that might have been. Maybe fifteen years ago. Maybe more. Two thousand four, maybe or yeah. five. Yeah, and yeah, you spoke really highly about being prepared, you know, so anything that you thought he wanted to do, you had accounted for, basically. Yeah, um, that's, that's that's just something that I learned at Berkeley. Um, right. And so I, I kind of, and I really got, put that to the test in Nashville. It's like hmm. everything down to like, okay, that, that piano player is going to want a pencil, you know, so he can write on his chart. And it's like, why not just have one out there, you know, like, or, uh, that drummer is going to need a new water because his water is almost empty, you know, like it's just stuff as small as that. And then all the way into mixing, it's like, you know, you, you start to learn about somebody or, oh, he's not going to like that much delay. Let me prepare, get mm -hmm. that where I think he's going to like it ahead of time. You know, anything yeah. that you can already have done just makes people feel more confident in you and want to hire you again. Uh, because it also comes across as speed, which everyone likes. Everyone likes a fast engineer, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned mi mixing there. Um, cause I just had an experience where, uh, cause I also do some, some library music and things. And, um, uh, in this case I didn't mix it myself, but another guy did. Um, but it came back completely 
uh, not wrong, but not in what my intention was. So that made me think how mixing can be so tricky, as I said, like knowing if someone likes a delay or not, you know. Right, right. Like you said. So uh, how do you go about understanding what a person wants as an artist um, in a mix? For, for a new client, you just have to talk to them or you just have to dive in, you know, and, and um, I usually kind of judge a situation and, and decide, okay, should I just dive in? And if it, if they don't like the first draft, we can change it. And maybe by the second or third draft, we have what they want. Or do I need to talk to them for 20 minutes about what they like musically and what they've envisioned this song to have? And maybe I even, I've heard the song and I have some ideas like, Hey, I, I kind of want to change the snare. What do you think if I put a deeper snare and they might be like, no, I kind of like the snare how it is. And then, you know, don't even bother, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of how I approach a new mix with a uh, new client. And then definitely after you've done the second or third mix for that person, you start to really understand what they like because you, you might come across the same things. Like I might like background vocals at a certain level, but they every time I put them at that level, they have me turn them down. Mm -hmm. So now I know, okay, well this this producer, he always hates it when I have the backgrounds loud. So let me turn them down, and so he doesn't even have to tell me now. You know? Yeah. So, but what yeah. sort of questions would you ask in the very beginning? Would you ask for albums to like? Uh, you can do that as far as concepts, but a lot of times they'll mention a bunch of old stuff. Hmm. you know from the 70s or 80s like their favorite old albums and it just doesn't have anything to do with what you're working on now you know and but it's just so you got to ask not necessarily what they like but what they what do they envision the song you're talking about the mix you're doing now like well, who compares to it and they might they might say oh I, i'd like uh you know i, I want a a live drum vibe you know like drums like the old stealing dan drums or something like that but so then if they mention an old record it's specific to the record you're mixing and you know that it's a sound that they're going for in their head you know so it's, it's just you're basically just trying to find out what's in their head and, and how they how they perceive it and the rough a rough mix is usually good for that so mm -hmm. unless they're not good at their rough mix but a lot of times people spend the time to get the rough mix to a point where they're everything's in the right level right panning right amount of reverb it just may not sound like a pro mix but the balance is there you know right so the rough mix is is very important yeah and is that something you do during tracking if you're recording them to you and just give them in at the end or how do you do that well the cool thing about tracking is that if i'm tracking and i'm going to be the mixer mm. i kind of almost dictate to a certain point how it's going to sound because i'm i'm getting the sounds and i'm balancing while they're concentrating on production and as long as they like what i'm doing then it, we kind of keep it and then by the time it gets to the mix it's just about polishing it so right. um that's one cool thing it's, it's or they'll if if you're not nailing exactly what you know if they're not happy with what you're you're the sounds you're coming up with they'll they'll tell you what to change, you know? So you're kind of getting it as you're, you're mixing as you're tracking. At least I, I usually am. I just, I always want the musicians or the producer to hear what we're tracking as if it's almost a finished record, you know? So, yeah. Uh, don't usually wait to, to mix later, you know? Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so looking back at your career, um, I mean, you still have a lot of career left, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but just wondering, are there any moments or several moments when you thought, oh, shit, I can't believe I'm working with this guy or this project? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Michael Jackson was like that, Brian McKnight, um, mm -hmm. Lupe Fiasco. I really was, uh, that was kind of a, just kind of out of left field Um the same person that had, had introduced me to um, the people that produced Usher, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and the Avila brothers. Um, he came around years later and was now introducing me to Lupe and his team and uh, ended up doing that whole album. We actually kind of, we tracked it and mixed it all in this building. So Eric would be tracking vocals while I was mixing. So it was kind of mm -hmm. like a factory and that was, 
that was cool and i just wasn't expecting that at all um i didn't know anyone from that camp so sometimes you just you can't envision being connected with a certain person so because there's just no you don't know a friend that knows them or you don't know anybody that knows them so you just think like like how am i ever gonna work with drake i don't know anybody that works with him you know Mm -hmm. it's so many degrees of separation and then next thing you know it's like oh i i know so and so that knows him and so then you you have a conversation with them like oh how uh you know how how do you know lupe how is he is he a cool guy or Mm-hmm. And then they're like, uh, yeah, you know what? You should mix for them. Let me, let me call their manager and, and, uh, see if I can put that together for you, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's why, that's why those relationships, you know, that was a, just the Lupe example. That's a relationship where I had already had success with that person introducing me to somebody and I didn't even work for him. I, he was just introducing me to somebody. Mm-hmm. So he was an important relationship, even though he himself wasn't a producer or engineer or anything, you know, hmm. he, uh, he's actually more of the manager side. And so, that so did you just ask him to introduce you to their team or how did you set the, the thing going? <clears throat> that one, he just, uh, it happened without me. And, and I guess <laughs> he was in a conversation like, Oh, you got, you're about to mix Lupe. You should call Bob Horn. And, and they're like, Oh, I've heard of him. Like, yeah, let's get him on the phone and see what he's talking about. And, no, I'm on a you know conference call with them, so that's how that one happened. But there, nice. you never know how it's going to happen. To make it can happen like your friend is sitting in a room at 3 a.m. Um, you know, like my my assistant here, he also works uh, at a record label that has a studio, and he can be sitting there and and you know somebody's talking about oh who should we get to mix this, um, and he can just yell out my name, and like that's just <laughs> one. Having him, <laughs> you know, support me is just yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good tactic, man. <laughs> so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I know. I used. I never really thought like making people feel good, but always trying to be their friend. You know, like um, I didn't have a lot of people skills when I first got out of college. I was just more focused on the music and mm. the recording and the quality. And I thought like, well, that's what everyone wants me to focus on. But it's like you got to be human first, you know, yeah. you gotta, yeah, you can't just be the quiet guy that has no personality because you'll be forgotten about, you know? Mm. So, so do you have any thing. advice for a person who might find themselves in that situation where they don't really know how to talk to artists or bands or whoever? Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I think it's, I wouldn't try to force it. I, I would try to let it be more natural. So instead of trying to, only talk to I mean, if you can't talk to bands and artists you probably can't talk to people in general so right. just work on personality like not being shy and um you know when you do a session and you're you know you're backing up a hard drive and you're waiting five minutes it's like like talk like hey what kind of uh restaurants do you like or what do what, you know do you play an instrument or you know where did you grow up just be personable and, and make conversation you know um if it's you know if it's if if you gotta like write down some conversation points you know just that's what you gotta do and you're like just just research people if you're if you're going to work with a producer get on the internet like see if he has a web page like google him see what else he's worked on like don't uh don't be some don't let wait to the point where you're surprised when he talks about how he used to work with madonna and you're like oh i didn't know you worked with madonna and that happens to be all over the internet that he worked with Madonna. You don't want to be that guy. You want to yeah. they're like, oh yeah, I read that about you. You want to be that guy, you know, like, oh yeah, I heard you did such and such album. That was cool. How was that? You know, was that here in the U S or London? Where'd you do that? You know, it's like have things like already in your arsenal to talk about, you know, mm-hmm. um, especially per session, like every session you go to know those people, if you can, and if, if there's nothing on the internet about them or, you can't ask a friend about them, then um, they just have general things to talk about ready, you know, and certainly get to, to know them. Like I, I have a, I have a friend, a big time mixer who has this trick when he meets somebody, he goes in the phone. If he, if he gets to the point of taking their phone number, he will add comments like, Oh, I met him at this barbecue and his wife's name is Karina. So next time 
he sees that person, he whips out his phone, he's like, wife's name's Karina. Hey, how's Karina? You know? Yeah, that's awesome. It's, it's a trick, you know? And it's because <laughs> you're not, no one would expect you to, to remember that. But when you do, they're like, man, that guy's awesome. He asked me about my wife, you know, and yeah. that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, it's just little tricks, you know? It's like some of us, we weren't born with those magical people skills. So you got to, you got to work on them, you know, but they're important for this, this business, you know? Yeah, for sure, man. That's really cool. Yeah. It's just, it doesn't require a lot. It's just the small details, you know? Right. Uh, but and, for people that are, that are shy, it's really scary. It's like, yeah, I have a thing to talk about. And it's like, you're overthinking it. It's like, there's plenty to talk about. Yeah. You just, now you're stuck in this, you're in the room with them and you're nervous and maybe they're, maybe they're really successful. So, uh, you know, you know, you know, you're just at a loss. You're just intimidated. You know, like, mm. what am I going to talk about with Michael Jackson? You just <laughs> sit here, like, yeah. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. You don't know like, what to do. Yeah, sorry. Hey, go ahead. Maybe no, no, no. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, could you just tell me a bit about? Because I'm really interested in the Michael Jackson session from what I heard in that video. How? I mean, obviously he's Michael Jackson, but what made it so special for you to work with him? Like, did what? What did it blow your mind? Um, <laughs> if you did. Well, I, I mean, I don't know that we got to a blow your mind point. We right. we did about we we worked for about a month building instrumental tracks for him, mm. and he would just kind of check in on them and and tell us the ones he liked, and then that just kind of gave the producer a direction of, uh, well, okay, so stop doing this kind of track because he didn't like that. Do more of this kind of track, you know, and so we we did about forty fifty. Uh, instrumentals for him and then we went to miami for a month and uh uh he wrote to him um with barry gibbs uh co-writing and then um we did a few vocal sessions uh but we we're really trying to find a sound for what would have been the next album you know right. um if he didn't pass away so mm -hmm. all the stuff we did was for um, I don't know if the album would have been called This Is It, like the tour, but it was. For, it would have been for that album. And uh, right. all that stuff is on a hard drive somewhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But it was more about uh, finding the grooves that he liked, the tempos, and, the, and sonically the sounds. Like, like they were doing a lot of interesting things, like miking, putting a microphone by the door and then pounding the door with their fist and layering that in with a kick drum and you know, just everything, anything you could think of that was just weird to do. They, they were trying to make stuff extra interesting and, you know, but it was more of an exploring Sonic, right? You know, sonic things. Did he um, bring any templates, so to speak, or sounds he had in mind? No, that, that's why it was, right. That's why it was so hard because it was, he would give you direction by almost like beatboxing or describing a sound, but not, he would never play any audio or records or anything for you or, or tell you like this song or, um, you know, he wouldn't sit down at a piano and play anything. He just, he would just put his head in the room and talk about a song or, or an idea and then leave. And then it was up to, you know, us to, you know, crank it out. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. We spent, we spent a month in Miami, a month at his house and then, um, a couple other spot dates, but, um yeah yeah it's very and very it's slow you're not expected to we always work fast because that's what we we did but we never expected like we were going to crank out four full songs you know even in a week you know it's like i think in a month we got down one and a half full songs wow you know? <laughs> okay even though we did you know 40 instrumentals you know mm. so very very slow working with him Right. So was that in his house in Neverland? Does he had was that No. Oh. Uh so at that point Neverland had been raided by the police. Oh, shit. He was in Beverly Hills. And uh right. so he was I, I I guess he had bought a house or he had a house in Beverly Hills and it had no studio, so we actually rented everything to make a studio oh. and I just put it all together in a room and he paid the rental fee for you know, like I think right. two months. Shit, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's not bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So there was anything else that happened during those sessions that comes to mind? One time he invited us up to Neverland to work early on. 
and we just figured like it's Neverland. There has to be a studio, an SSL, an assistant. And we got there, and there's nothing. And he's oh. like, "So did you bring the equipment?" And all we had was a hard drive and an MPC <laughs> uh, sequencer. Right. So just messed around all day, like walking around, like watching movies, you know, eating crazy food. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you got the tour of the place, then I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But right. well, we didn't work on anything that on that ah, trip. Okay. Sure. So, yeah. yeah. Kind of fun. That's cool, man. So when did he pass away? Was it two thousand nine? eight nine i believe nine right yeah so none of those songs came on to that album they released afterwards i forgot the name of it Uh, no that was uh that was just older stuff on hard drives um Ah. that they just kind of went through and and tried to finish up and and release the stuff that was actually current i don't know if they will release it or or not our our personal stuff for our team was pretty unfinished you know but mm. i'm sure he was working with other producers you know in that year when he wasn't working with us um so yeah i don't know if that stuff will be released or not but uh he's very like i said to finish a song it's like he comes on in and, and lays down a vocal melody and then he leaves mm. and then I'll come back later and lay down the lyrics and melody for one verse, but the rest of it is still just a melody right. or, you know, it's just like, it's not a good vocal track. It's not a finished thing. So for him to finish a whole song, I mean, it just takes a really long time. Yeah. So I don't know of all the stuff that's out there. I don't know if there's a lot of finished stuff, you know, right. But right. My, my personal opinion is it he's such a picky person nothing should be released because I don't think he would personally like it. You know, mm. if he, if he would, it would already have been done and released. So, yeah. Yeah. Just, For uh, sure. yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, so just looking back again, um, not to repeat the question, but just looking at the other side of the, the coin, you know, so has there been any moments when you thought, damn, I don't know if I can keep doing this. Uh, yeah, so here's here's the tough thing about what we really do is like there, there's many avenues of engineering. Uh, anything from you could engineer for uh, a local TV station, and it's a normal job. You go home at six p.m. and you have health benefits, and uh, you know exactly how much your m- money you're making that year, that month, that week. You know, and uh, then there's the jobs, kind of like what I do, and what a lot of people. Uh, would like to do which is completely freelance so as soon as you do the job you don't know how much money you're going to make there's no benefits you have to pay for your own insurance and it's it's a very you know every, every time a job's done unemployed again until that next job you know so the trick is the game is to stack up lots of jobs so you know for the foreseeable future you have work you know um but i've had i've had entire albums drop out or something happened and we were about to we were about to work on a project and let's say maybe i was going to make ten thousand dollars because it was so much time and something happened and all of a sudden we're not doing that project you know Mm -hmm. um so now all of a sudden i had told all my other you know colleagues and, and clients like oh i'm busy these two weeks we'll have to work later uh, or you have to go use another engineer, you know, and now all of a sudden I have two weeks free. Mm-hmm. So you're kind of scrambling and calling the people like, Oh, Hey, did you hire another engineer? Cause now I'm, I'm, I'm a free now, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So it's scary and it's rough. And um, there's times where I think uh, some of us that are extra crazy, you know, when that happens, all of a sudden you're like, I can't do this anymore. I have to get a regular job. Uh, maybe I'll be a teacher at a college or, you know, go back to school and, and then all of a sudden the phone rings and you have a job and, you know, you're like, Oh, okay, I'm fine. Yeah. So, yeah. It's kind of, kind of like that, you know? Yeah. You know? But does those quiet times get any easier or do you still find yourself uh, not panicking, but, you know, being fearful? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I think that's, it just depends how, how you are, like as, as passionate as, as some of us are when we're working, when we're not working, it's, it's that much 
it's the same passion. It's just, but it turns into to fear, you know. And it's, I mean, you can tell yourself like, oh, I'm I usually am always working and I'm good, so I'm gonna have some kind of job, you know. But I, I think some of us just can't think like that until the phone actually rings, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think the longest stretch I haven't in 20 years that I haven't worked has been two weeks. And that's because I was sick or ill, you know? Right. Um, usually it's just a day or two, but during that day or two, you're like, Oh my God, my career's over. I I can't afford anything. I'm in trouble. You know, it's just, it's, it's dumb, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. It's probably good to think that way. It keeps yourself on your toes and, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, everyone handles it differently, I think. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what I found anyway. Um, but yeah, interesting. Um, so do you have a favorite failure, as in a failure that set you up for later success? Oh, wow. Yeah, failure. Um, I have a favorite type of failure, which... Mm-hmm. Ha- has happened a few times but i can't think of a specific actual moment but i'd say the one that pays off the best is when specifically specifically to mixing when you don't nail a mix and uh so you're you're either about to learn from that situation or hopefully learn from that client and uh i can't tell you how many times you know i've learned from uh, a producer where I took all or part of a mix in the wrong direction and then they kind of taught me what they wanted and then all of a sudden I added that to my arsenal so my mixes after that I had a new sound that I could I could go back to what I usually did but now I can add in what he just taught me into my thing and um that's happened you know from just drums or an entire mix or just vocals. Um, and it's funny cause sometimes I'll be mixing for a client and I'll have all these different ways to do something in my head and I'll have to try to guess which, which one is he going to like, you know, mm. but those failures, even when it's just, I mean, failure is probably a strong word, but like when, when someone doesn't like, they like all of a mix, but one part, you know, um, but then you get to find out, hopefully how to fix that for them and basically i think that's how at least how for me that's how i've learned mixing is do a mix and then you're taught by that client what's wrong with it and how to fix it and you know you go down the list of of clients there's so many clients over a 20-year period so i've learned a lot you know from that yeah Um, but as far as like catastrophic failures like erasing a song or something that's like i kind of got a lot of that out of my system at berkeley <laughs> um, <laughs> you know so erasing entire songs off of a, <laughs> a two inch reel of tape and wow yeah and, um yeah and, and i mean there's definitely been times where um you just don't agree with somebody or don't see eye to eye with somebody and it's just not going to work and you have to cut your losses but at the same time, there's there's always money on the table involved, as well as uh, time and deadlines, and also relationships. You know, it's like if you if you're gonna walk away from a particular project, uh, then it's you have to realize that you might be killing this this tree of your branch. You might be killing this particular relationship. Um, so you have to do it the best way possible. You know. Hmm. Um, yeah yeah that makes sense man yeah cool um well, that was actually my last question <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> well, uh, thank you thank you very much bob of course thank you again bob for doing the interview it was awesome talking to you and i hope you the listener got a lot out of it as well but yeah again check out the new guide uh three tested ways of increasing your client base at your audiosolutions.com um, and leave a comment letting me know if you like this audio format and I will keep doing it. Take care.